Um, do you write spot or <laughs> 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 session. Hope you all had a good lunch and are uh, still ready to attend to some more good stuff. Um, I'm Glenn Kleiman for the Friday Institute. This is the, the panel on what's in the works. Um, I think of this as the uh, getting up to date on all the cool new technology things that are happening. Uh, we're fortunate to have with us today on the panel, starting from the far end, Eric Moore, who's the project coordinator for the Instructional Improvement System at DEI. And next to Eric is Helga Fasciano, Section Chief for K-12 Programs in the IIS, Instructional Improvement System Business Worker. Larry Craiglow, who's a consultant here at the Friday Institute working with the cloud computing team. And Kayla Seiler, who's a policy and planning analyst at DPI and is our, our expert on assessment 2014, balanced assessment, and all the other assessment stuff. Uh, the plan is to have Larry tell you a little bit about the cloud, Eric and Helga tell you a little bit about the IAS, and Kayla tell you a little bit about the assessment work, uh, taking up to 10 minutes each. They did a good job this morning, they stuck within the time limit. And then that will give us plenty of time for questions. You know, there's tons of information. I learned a lot in the morning session getting up to date on all this, and these are the folks who can answer your questions. Um, as we go, um, if there's a question you really need to ask after a specific presentation because you're confused or need some clarity, please do so. Otherwise, I think we'll let all three present, we'll get the whole picture, and then have a half hour plus for questions, if that's okay. And with that, let's turn it over to Larry. Good. Thank you, Brian. Uh, so what, what I'm going to try to do is just provide a really a top-level sort of description of what what the context is that we're sort of working the cloud project within, and then talking a little bit about the history and what it is, uh, and I'll give you some hint as to what's next, but really what's next is yet to develop, uh, uh, and, uh, but that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, so first, uh, the instructional context, and you know, I would applaud what's going on here at the Friday Institute yesterday and today, that, the NCLTI process and the context that it provides for what it is that schools in the state are attempting to do as we move towards achieving our goals is, is, is really a great way to begin to sort of figure out how it all fits together because that's a real issue. How does this all fit together? Uh, and so the instructional context that we sort of like to summarize uh, is, that, is that we're all working on the goal of a sustainable solution. That means that you have to be able to afford it. Uh, but also an effective use of data to drive some instruction and informs decisions in such a way that enables individual student learning. So this is about individual student learning. And one of the reasons why that's really applicable today when it wasn't yesterday is that common core and central standards are a, are a big thing and it's a common thing that allows standardization and, and a balanced approach to assessment is a second thing. Those, those instructional uh, innovations uh, uh, really help support this goal of individualized uh, student learning. So that's the context. Uh, the technology that we're working on is basically sort of behind the curtain, kind of like plugging in the, to the electrical outlet. Uh, and, uh, and so mostly what's driving these plans is the instructional vision uh, supported by the technology. Uh, and we sort of like to look at it that way. So, uh, so the, the cloud uh, project is a continuation of 
uh, of the school connectivity initiative, which really was implemented four years ago. So who who knows what the school connectivity issue is and was? Initiative. Initiative. Yes. Is that what I said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was initiative. Oh, right. yes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so that uh, was a, a project that ended up receiving state funding, uh, provided reliable high bandwidth to every school, uh, scalable network connections to all the schools, and uh, in a consulting sort of network assistance. Uh, that's uh, available to schools. Uh, really the precursor to and the initiation of a long-term sort of uh, technology program. So that got funded and fortunately raised at the top. Cloud project uh, also got uh, funded uh, thanks to Glenn and, and, and many others. And the cloud is really, a, it, it's, a, it's an IT, an instructional or a, a, a uh, an, an IT infrastructure that uh, really is outside the LEA domain. So historically, not just with, with education, but technology has been a local thing. Local PCs, local wireless device, local internet connection, local servers, local software programs, local resources, all of which have to be supported. In fact, over in lunch, I was supported you know, at my desk uh, on some of these issues. That's expensive and not a scalable process. Uh, and so the cloud is a, an approach to take much of that outside the LEA domain and put it into a cloud environment, which is really uh, a service uh, that's provided by a vendor that you can have access to uh, scale it, use it, pay for it when you need it. Uh, and, uh, and so it's a, it's that, the core of the issue, it's the core of the cloud issue. Uh, what we're attempting to do uh, is to allow the LEAs uh, to take advantage of those cost advantages of that kind of scaling. Uh, that would allow them to have sort of anywhere, anytime access. Obviously we're trying to achieve that. Uh, yeah, we're trying to take advantage of the efficiencies and the economies of that kind of uh, functionality and scale, and then to refocus the limited technology resources, the limited people that are uh, in, the, in the LEAs to focus on instruction. That's the hope. Uh, and, uh, and, and so those are the major goals that we you know, set out to try to achieve. I know that's really top level, but, the, but the, the, the basic understanding of what is the cloud and what are we doing means we're taking a lot of things away from the LEA's domain. They all have control of it. They just don't know where it is. Kind of like Glenn said, here at the Friday Institute, our servers are someplace else. We don't need to know where they are, you know, but it, it's a great service. We uh, visited every LEA. Uh, we spent about a half, uh, half a day reviewing a uh, 300 question interview to try to develop a baseline as to, so what are you doing? Uh, what are you uh, planning to do? What needs to be done? Uh, and how can we sort of take that information and make some sense of it? It took us about a year actually to finish all that. Uh, during those discussions, there were four, three basic platforms. Uh, sort of the business operations platform, sort of how do we handle personnel, how do we handle budgets, how do we handle all the, all the administrative kind of stuff, data. Uh, uh, there's the infrastructure or enterprise platform, that's all this technology stuff we're talking about, uh, and, I, and the most important uh, uh, and the most sort of elusive at times is the instructional. So where, so, so we surveyed and gathered information on all three. Obviously the easiest to tabulate is the technical, because you can count computers and you can count servers and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, it's pretty hard to determine which teachers were ready to do what kind of new innovative kind of, 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 of teaching. But against those three basic platforms, business, infrastructure, and instruction, uh, uh, we're driving sort of our cloud projects. So 
so this is sort of like, so what, what will cloud uh, address? And, 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 and we really have service delivery platforms, so how, how will we deliver these services? Uh, and it's sort of LMS learning management systems. Uh, uh, those systems, uh, many LDAs have them. Many have something that's similar to that. Many have none. But to, to communicate and deliver and have access to resources in the cloud, you must have uh, devices, you must have a web browser, uh, and you've got to have an LMS system that allows you to reach out, pull it back, and share it. Uh, and so that would be one. A learning objects repository. So all of these resources that we envision, and you'll hear uh, these guys talk a bit about the IIS, so we, we envision lots of resources, uh, and, uh, and they need to be someplace where everyone can get to them. Uh, so a learning object repository is, uh, is, is uh, in the offing uh, in cooperation with the community college system. Collaborative tools, all kinds of collaborative tools. There will be a, 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 an evaluation of what's useful and what isn't useful uh, and some consolidation of that. Uh, but today there's millions of dollars spent on collaborative tools that have to be supported in every classroom and in, within a district each school has its own collaborative tools, all of which have to be supported. Uh, sort of uneconomic and inefficient, but it could be instructionally, that's you know the way it's going to, it needs to be. Uh, and then uh, a, a really mundane sort of thing is uh, identity management, and that is uh, this would be uh, for all stakeholders a single sign on, which allows you to access anything on your web browser in the cloud with a single identity. Uh, there are districts who have 12 identities and passwords to get to things. This would be a single one. Uh, and so that's sort of an example of the service delivery platforms that are underway. And then there are lots of shared infrastructure services, even more mundane than a password, servers, email, uh, and content filtering, malware protection, uh, those kinds of things that everybody's buying and, uh, and, and that will, our thought is to apply these objectives to that. So how do we aggregate the demand and go out for a bid and get a really great convenience contract for the state? So those are some of the, those are the broad categories of projects. Uh, and uh, that, that we are underway. We have, a, we have eight uh, RFPs that will be sort of released in the next six weeks, and that specificity uh, is sort of the next version of a communication story uh, and is what the LEA sort of mostly want to hear about. So what are you going to do for me? When it's going to be available, how much it's going to cost? Is that what are you going to do for me or to me that they want to know about you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so that's a, sort of a, a, a snapshot of the overview and some of those projects. Uh, and I'd be happy to sort of, you know, provide a little bit more of that information, you know, when we get to the question and answer section. But that's sort of a quick, a quick look at cloud. Thank you, Aaron. Okay. We move on to, to Eric and Milner and the IIS. So good afternoon. Um, I'm Eric Moore. I'm a fiscal analyst with the department, but I also serve as the IIS project coordinator. Helga and I will be tag teaming this one. I'll talk about the boring pieces of it, which is actually what's happening with the project itself. And Helga will be able to talk about the product and the vision for what it's going to do for the students and educators in North Carolina. Um, so just for a little bit of history, if you actually look at our application for what is under pillar C3, which is data systems to improve instruction. You'll find a description of an instructional improvement system that is really centered on assessments. Um, a system that will deliver statewide summative assessments, a system that will deliver uh, district-wide benchmark assessments, and a system that will deliver in-class formative assessment, diagnostic assessment kinds of products. When that was originally written into our application, that's what an instruction improvement system looked like. Uh, since then, much time has transpired between writing that application, 
not making phase one of the grant award, making phase two of the grant award, being funded, and now planning, the market has changed dramatically about what an instructional improvement system looks like. What we found is that now there are a lot more than assessment systems. Now the vendors who have gone into the space tend to market them as one-stop shops for education. Everything a teacher, parent, principal, student him or herself would need to individualize education. So what does that look like? I'll, turn, I'll leave more of that to what Helga's talking about, but suffice to say it's much more than education, not much more than assessment for education. It involves a lot more resources, um, professional development, almost a 360 kind of view. And that is kind of where we've gone with it. This past June, we were able to hire the Center for Educational Leadership and Technology, CELT, out of Marble, Massachusetts. They have done work in other states helping them plan for their instructional improvement system. Some were raised to the top states, some weren't. But they brought in a body of knowledge about what other states have asked for. They sat with us, spent a lot of time in the department. They went out to the regions with us. They sat in meetings where we brought people from the regions to the department to talk and gather requirements. And what they've done is spent a lot of time putting that together into a request for a proposal for the actual system that is finally in a place where it's mostly done. Um, right now, it has left the department. It is sitting with our statewide ITS, or Information Technology Services, because they review all of the technology projects that the state is doing. It goes through a number of different areas within them. As I've heard right now, it's going through their legal review, which I believe is one of their last steps before they approve it, hopefully not reject it, but approve it. And once they give us the green light, which we're hoping is any day now, it will post to the statewide interactive purchasing system for six weeks. We'll invite vendors to respond. We are anticipating there to be a lot of different kinds of responses from different kinds of vendors because the space has grown, grown so much that uh, learning management system vendors have kind of morphed their technology into do it. Assessment vendors have morphed their technology. Vendors who have primarily just done data integration have kind of come up with applications that sit on top of it that do the same kind of technology. So we're, we're anticipating quite a lot of response to the uh, to your RFP. Once the, the bidding window closes, we're right now planning on about a month and a half to two months of review uh, to go through all the responses, to score them, to select um, our top tier of choices, to bring them in into demonstrations where we're going to try and get more folks from the districts involved to kind of see and hear what the vendors are saying they'll provide. And ultimately, award a contract which year. Very hopeful will be this summer. Once that gets done, we're going to know a lot more about what the IS is going to look like uh, for everybody, for us, for the school districts, for everybody. We're going to spend the rest of this year making sure the DPI's own house is in order with regard to data integration and making sure our systems as they are will feed data into this new IIS without major hiccups and students not appearing where they're supposed to be and teachers not being where they're supposed to be in the system and you know, the kinds of things that we'll inevitably face you know, trying to head off at the beginning. And then we'll spend next calendar year starting to pilot. And what we're imagining the pilot looks like right now is this kind of series of phase and overlapping pilots. So some districts may be piloting the more instructional pieces where they're, they're dealing with how does the system put out resources and collect information about usage of the resources. Other districts may be doing assessments, so they may try out some benchmarking assessments or some diagnostics within the classroom. And others may be trying out the more PD aspects, getting the teachers to engage with professional development via the system and then seeing how it jives with stuff they've already been doing with the NC education and things that they're doing locally. And just kind of have a series of those. We don't exactly know what that will look like, but we're hopeful that when we go into the 13-14 school year, most likely by the end of that year, we will have a system that will have all of those pieces and could be available statewide. Now, while we're doing this kind of process for the actual tool, we want to make sure that the tool has stuff that's actually usable when people turn it on and go to use it. We don't want an empty shell to be sitting out in the school districts that's of no value to anybody. So we're starting a parallel process where we're trying to uh, establish a permanent team that's going to be in charge of discovering content, Align, making sure the content is aligned to standards, whatever appropriate standards there are, Common Core, um, NC Essential Standards, Professional Teaching Standards, you know, whatever is applicable to that particular learning object. 
they will align it, they'll make sure it's vetted, give the appropriate tags so that it's discoverable in the system whenever we get the system, and we'll actually be in charge of loading it uh, via this learning object repository that the cloud is putting out there. So our hope is to go ahead and have some stuff available potentially before the IS is available, but at least when the IS comes around, there will be some rich resources in there for different kinds of purposes, at least as a proof of concept for what the system in general will contain state as it goes out in the 13 portions. So that I will turn it over. Good afternoon, I'm Helga Bassiano, um, Section Chief of K-12 Programs, and I'm housed in the Curriculum and Instruction Division at DPI. And this sounds like a marriage, and it is, because part of the job of being on the instructional side is to push our technology folks. And the technology folks have been able to say to us, yes, but let's write it in and let's make it sustainable. It's been wonderful, eye-opening conversations. But I wanted to share with you what the vision for the Instructional Improvement System is. And this is a draft of um, what will be published, uh, so there might be some tweaking. But just so that you understand what the vision for the IIS is. All North Carolina students, parents, and educators will have equitable access to information and resources they need to make ongoing decisions about individualized teaching and or learning. And if you think about the districts where you work, the districts that you're working with, and trying to assist and make achievement improvements for the learners in that district, you can see where having something like this would really make that job doable. Because right now, everyone has more or less a hodgepodge of mechanisms, processes, applications available to them to make this happen. And everyone is working just as hard as they can for the achievement of our students. So if you look at the mission of what we see in working together with our technology folks, is to support the teaching and learning process, because it is a process. There is not a one fix, if we had that, most of us wouldn't even be in this room. It is a process because every child that is in our school system is an individual that needs their own GPS for learning. And you may have heard our state superintendent, Dr. Atkinson, talk about that GPS system for, for learners. And don't forget that your teachers are learners too, and so are you. Because at all times, you should be able to go into the system and find uh, within this online platform things that are going to allow analytics, links between content, assessment, and standards, because if you don't triangulate, you're not going to hit the achievement. You should be able to find a student profile, everything you need to know about that student right there, available at your fingertips. And the mechanism for that is a dashboard, which is kind of a fancy word, think about your car. But the whole idea is, is if you are the teacher in the classroom, your dashboard or your interface to this portal, this one single sign log in is customizable. So as the educator in the classroom, you're going to be able to pull up on your dashboard readily, I need to see my classroom. I need to see what my PD is because I need to be doing PD as well. I need to see where my meetings are. I need to be able to contact parents. I need to be able to give feedback to my students. So everything is right there on that portal. As the administrator of that school, that administrator knows I need to be able to check in with this teacher, I need to see what's happening here. The parent is going to have to find a way to, to you know, interface with everyone. When they sign on, they also will have a single access by which they can communicate with their teachers, uh, the teachers of their students, the administration if they need to. So the whole interface is going to help support the whole process of learning. And that's what this is about. This is about our students, our children, and our school systems. And that's what the vision is to support, because if it's going to make your job easier, then all it's going to do is raise the achievement of the students. It's also going to empower the students, because they can take some ownership in their learning. That student can log in. And I know we've talked about connectivity, and we know that the connectivity is getting out there. We do know that all those schools don't have all the resources yet, but we know because the connectivity is getting out there, that they're taking the steps to make sure that the other pieces of the technology are in place. So lots of things are going to change around this whole paradigm to make that accessibility equitable across this state. So think about it in terms of 
moving forward, knowing that we'll have these things available to us. So it's going to uh, provide the delivery system for the assessment items. We've talked about the summative, but also benchmark. Districts have benchmark, others don't. So again, this will level that playing field across the state. But don't forget also your uh, formative assessment strategies. And products that might be out there to help students as well. Uh, educator evaluation functionality. If the educator, the teacher of the third grade classroom sees, well, this student is just not mastering this content, then the whole kind of big piece of that is that we're looking for a recommendation engine that if you say, this student is not mastering this, what can we do? And that recommendation engine is going to help that teacher to find resources, including professional development for the teacher, so that they can master it in a way pedagogically to be able to pass that on to the students. By the same token, parents can log in and do the same thing. If I see that my son or daughter is struggling here, what are some resources I can access to help him or her learn? So it's coming back again to that focus on this is for the student, it's not about the adults, this is for the student and their learning process. So you will have everything aligned to standards because we need to do that, we need to have a triangulation. It's going to allow that assessment, it's going to allow that platform where the teachers can readily access everything they need for their lesson planning and again make sure everything standards based and aligned. Uh, coming back to the educator evaluation, if the administrator is logging in and they're seeing, I have a teacher here who is struggling with this particular standard, then that administrator is going to be able to locate resources for that teacher to help make that teacher a more effective teacher in the classroom. So you can see how everything comes together. And then the profiles and samples, how powerful for students to be able to collect those samples. Thank you for the Learning Object Repository Cloud and move forward because once a student understands where they are in the learning continuum, they take ownership and they're going to fly. So think about that big vision that this is what's going to happen. Understand that it's going to happen and be rolled out as Eric was talking about. We're going to start with the basic pieces. And we've had an advisory task group that's been working with the department and um, also with the NC State Cloud team that is informing what pieces need to come out first. What, what, what we've got to have on the ground running and then build on that capacity as we move forward. Okay, thank you. So we have an overview of the technology platform in the cloud, an overview of resources for teaching and learning for students, teachers, and parents, and then the next layer of this is the, the statewide accountability assessment system. Thank you. Um, over for an update on that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kayla Tyler. I'm a policy and planning analyst with the Department of Open Library Sub Shop Program Management Office under Adam Watson. And one of my tasks has been over the last year and a half or so to work on the online assessment work across the agency, kind of uh, working with a group where we're combining the assessment and test development folks with the technology folks and trying to figure out, okay, how can we support schools and districts as we look at our goal of having everything online for assessment purposes, statewide summative of assessments, by the 2014-15 school year. And so working with them, trying to figure out, okay, how can we help, how can we communicate that this is coming, how can we get folks to understand what this means, why it's different, what's going to be different from the old test and what you've seen before, and then how we can move forward. So just start with a little bit of history of where, where we've been with online assessments. Um, many of you know we started with online assessments in 2005. That was the first year that the computer skills test was all online. Before it had a computer component, but a paper pencil test part. But in 2005, we had the entire test online. That was our first real online assessment. From there, in 2007, we started putting the high school in the course exams online. And in the 2007-2008 school year, physics was actually required online. So most schools have some experience. They had to do that physics test, or they've done the computer skills test online. So they've at least attempted to use the online system for administering the student test. Um, after that 2007-2008 school year, all of the high school EOCs, so Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Biology, Civics, English, uh, Geometry, and U.S. History, many of which we don't have anymore, but all the ones that we had at the time, we moved them to an online format. They were available to all schools to use online. Now, early on, we didn't have a lot of people take the online option. It was kind of somebody would try it in their technology or assessment person would get excited, ooh, online test, let's try it. And they, they might try it in one school and not in another school. And it was very sparse across the state. We had about 3% of the total tests given in the 8-9 school year were online. This past fall semester, there were up to about 14% of folks doing their online assessments 
online. And again, what we have online currently is just those high school exams. Then, of course, tests. So right now, it's just for Algebra 1, English 1, and Biology assessments that are available online for this current school year. So that's where we are this year. This year, all the tests that are being administered for the statewide summative tests are your regular, traditional, the uh, math and English for grades 3 through 8, even pencil versions for those students. You have your science at the um, 5 and 8, biology, all the, all the high school tests available online, the most people get in the paper pencil option, and all of the other tests are standard. The other thing we're doing this year is field testing, what we're calling the next generation of assessments, the new assessments that are aligned to the new standards, the Common Core, the Essential Standards, all officially aligned, and that are designed for an online format. So you have a lot of schools and districts that have been participating in the field test. They did field testing in the fall, and they're currently doing field testing this spring, getting people to try and log into the new system. So that's where we are this year. Next year, for the 12-13 school year, we will have operational um, online assessments that are aligned to Common Core and State Standards. So all the tests will be aligned with the standards that are being implemented next year. That's a question that a lot of folks ask. Like, are being tested on something different than what we're being taught? No, we're implementing the same time. Next year is when the new standards are fully implemented in schools. Next year is when the new assessments will be available that are directly aligned to those new standards. So that's one important point. And then we'll also begin with the new generation of assessments available online next year. So what we will have online, this will be the first wave of full online administration, meaning that the test work is specifically designed for this new online format next year. All the high school stuff, so your regular math one or algebra one, your English 2, it'll be the English 2 test next year, it's been English 1 the past next year, English 2, and Biology at high school. Those are all online. Next year we'll also have Science at grades 5 and 8 online. So those will be available for elementary school and middle school to get their first attempt at online assessments, 5 and 8 to Science. And then the other thing that will be operational next year is the Extend 2 versions of those same tests. All the high school Extend 2 and all of the elementary middle Extend 2, that includes the English and Math for Extend 2s will be available online next year. So that'd be something a little bit different, having all those. But next year, all extend twos, as I said, will be online, and then your high school and science exams for all the for regular students will be online. Then the goal will be that in 14-15, everything is online. And the question came up in the panel before, if I said available, everything will be available online. We're not using the word required. It's not required that everything, that you take it online just because it's there. We know that there are circumstances in which you would have to have a paper pencil option but you know the tests are being designed for a computer, so a paper pencil version will be slightly different than what you see on the computer. So there will be an alternate paper pencil version available, and it'll kind of phase in as we get to that point. And over the next two to three years, that's where we're starting next year, getting what we can operational, and that's the Extend 2s, the Science, and the high school exams, and then about 15, 15 all of those exams for every grade level will be online. We have a new challenge that we get to 14, 15, though, that'll change things. Many of you know we're members of the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium, there were two consortia that were granted uh, additional race to the top grants by the federal government, and we decided to join Smarter Balance. As members of that consortium, we will we agree to adopt the assessments that they are developing that are directly related to Common Core. So those are only your math and ELA assessments. Our science assessments that we already have, we can continue to use just like we have, because those are aligned to our standards. There's not a Common Core or a national science standard right now. So we're looking at just new assessments for math and ELA beginning in the 14-15 school year that are provided by the Smart Balance Assessment Group. Uh, what that means is that we have some decisions to make. Um, in 14-15, we will adopt the new assessments for grades 3 through 8 in math and ELA. That's a pretty logical step. But then at the high school level, their assessments are a little bit different. Right now, we have assessments by course. So we have like an outdoor one end of course assessment. The Smart Balance is just doing a one-time cumulative math and ELA assessment at grade 11 which is different than what we've had in the past. It's more of their college readiness measure. And this year, as you know, we adopted the ACT to be a college readiness measure for our high schoolers. So in 14-15, um, we may not want to do the ACT anymore. We may, we may want to just use the Smart Balance Assessment. Or we may say ACT is more valuable. We'd like to continue that. Students can use that to get into college. The Smart Balance Assessment is not necessarily going to be a college entry exam like the ACT or the SAT are now for students. So we may want to keep that, but then there's funding and other things that we'll have to look at at that time. Uh, also, the end of, like I said, the, the assessment is not aligned to a course, so we may want to keep our math one or algebra one test because we don't have that measure anymore with Smarter Balance. We may want to keep our English two assessment because the Smarter Balance assessment will be slightly different, you know, a combined test and a more cumulative one-time test. And then, of course, biology and the science assessments, we would keep the same because that's not something that's being tested on the national scale with these 
consortia because it's not part of common form. So we would keep our same size assessment slope that we've had in the past. Um, going from there, uh, just a few things, some questions that we get a lot are why are we doing the online thing and then what are the benefits? So one of the big why, and the answer to the why, is the um, idea of computer adaptive testing. Smarter Balance is designing all of their tests, um, all the assessments they're working on, in a computer adaptive format. And what that means, if you're not familiar with that, is that as a student takes the test, depending on how they, an how they answer one question, determines the next question. So if you get this question right, you might get a harder question. If you get that question right, it gets harder. If you get it wrong, you might go back down a level and see, you know, okay, the student didn't quite get that, let's try again, let's see if they can get it. So what you can do with that is have a shorter test. In a shorter amount of time, you can figure out how much the student has mastered. You can have smaller testing windows because it doesn't take so much time to test. So that it goes to the benefits. Once we have the um, everything in place, everything working as it should, then smaller testing windows, less time, you're able to use more instructional days, less time on testing. It's more beneficial to the student to not sit there with a huge test book for hours just feeling like they're staring at nothing. And they have the computer, it's quick, easy, done. Grades are in, they don't have to sit there and bubble in sheets. You know, that can cause stress for students when they get off on a bubble line. There's no bubble lines to get off on the online test. You just click the answer and you move on to the next one. It keeps a little bit smoother going through that. You also have benefits with accommodations. Um, the online design is more universal design. You have more options to change background color. Quick and easy to meet a student accommodation need. You don't have to have a special paper version printed on a different piece of paper. You just say, this one needs to be purple. And you click on that screen and they get a purple background. Font size, you can change a lot easier, adjust it larger for visually impaired students, make sure it's accurate for what they need to meet that accommodation. And another really big one that's important for a lot of districts is to know that there's a computer read aloud option, which we've experimented with some in the past, but the new test version does have that computer read aloud where the student could wear headphones and be in the same room in the same setting as other students and just be able to select when they need the question read to them. That way you don't have to have all these separate settings with extra proctors and extra time of giving students additional test time. Now you do have students who have to have a separate setting because that is their accommodation that would change. They of course you have to meet their need. But if it's something where they can just wear the headphones and do on demand, meets that need and it saves the school some time and it allows the student just to test with someone else. They don't have to feel isolated and testing by themselves in another situation. So that's that's another big um, benefit there. Another important thing is you think about the technical requirements for the system. Uh, currently, our tests are done through a system called NC Test, which is um, housed through NC State University with the Thomas organization. Um, this fall, they had their new specifications for the new system, uh, NC Test version 2.5, which is operational this year. If, they're, if, you're, um, if you have folks that are testing this year, they're using Test 2.5. Um, most any browser works, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Safari, Chrome, all compatible. The only thing is uh, a lot of schools are running on the older version of Internet Explorer. They have IE6. It does not operate on IE6. We're no longer supporting that browser for uh, the assessment system, but anything newer is fine. So most people have moved well beyond that. I mean, they're up to the 9 or 10 now <laughs> on IE6. But if anyone still has that, they would run into problems with taking the test. The other big requirement right now that is a problem is Flash. Flash Player is required for the current test system, but that is going away. This year, if you were using the test, there are drag and drop questions that are required to move things on the screen. There's a highlighting feature, a calculator that comes up on screen, a couple of things like that that are all flash based. We're redesigning that um, through the work. There's a couple of things <coughs> going on right now with the top organization in the testing to come up with a better way to display that so that you don't have to have flash. And that your basic requirement is just if you can get to the internet and you get to this, you'll be fine. And that way we align with the requirements looking at the instructional improvement system that Eric and Helga were just telling us about that we will move our assessment system into that system. You would access it all in the same way. You would have to go through NC test a separate system. It would be through the instructional improvement system. You have everything you need right there. All the requirements would be the same. You wouldn't have to say, okay, this device can only be used for testing. This device has to be used for this. Everything would work. It would all be the same. So hopefully those requirements get a whole lot easier and easier for folks to understand. But we are testing a lot of that. I know I get updates every now and then when they're going to change the technical requirements. They put a note out there that says, I've had testing right now. We're <laughs> trying to figure that out. We're trying to make sure it works. So that's the question again. You know, we have what about tablets and what about iPads, but it won't work. Well, it will, which is not quite there yet. So this year it doesn't work, but hopefully beginning next year it will. So look for updates on that. The technical requirements are available online if you're familiar with NC Education. All the NC test information is in there. I think Cynthia was putting some of the links on the wiki for today so you can get to some of this information. Um, all right, uh, one last two things I'll mention here. 
there is an online assessment tutorial. I'd recommend that you all take a look at it just to be familiar, and it's something you can definitely recommend to uh, teachers, principals, anyone that you're working with. It's public available parents, anyone can look at it. But what it, it just allows you to kind of log into the testing system like you are taking the test. You get to see what it looks like. You get to see what a question looks like. You get to see what the calculator looks like. You get to play with the highlighter and try to highlight things on the screen. You see how the buttons work, you know, which button is next and which button is back. There's a flagging feature for students where if you want to flag the question when you get to the end, the test would tell you, hey, you flagged number five, did you want to go back and look at that again? So it, it, you get to try that and see how it works and what you, can you end with the flag on or can you not end? It tells you all those things. So it's very helpful for students to see that before they have to take the test. That's what we encourage to make sure that all schools, if you're going to do online testing, make sure you let the students practice. Go to this practice site. You can select the different tests because each test may have something a little bit different. English tests may have a constructive response that a math test would not have, so you want to see what that looks like. The math test might have an interactive something on the screen that you actually have to move that another test would have, so you want the student to see what that's like and how to do it with the mouse instead of having them to draw it out on their paper. So that's kind of a very important thing. Make sure you direct people to that. That's available also if you can see education and see test um, system. It's one of the links there. It's called the online assessment tutorial. That's a helpful resource. And then we also have another set of resources on the online assessment website. We have a best practices guide that was put together uh, based on some interviews and visits with LEAs and schools that are already doing some online assessment work. We ask them, you know, what works for you? What doesn't work? How would you recommend this to others? We also talk to districts that haven't tried it yet and said, why not? What's holding you back? What would help you to move forward? What can we do to give you additional resources? Or how can we help you put things together. So we kind of came up with a checklist. What could a teacher do to help in her classroom? What could an administrator do? What could the test coordinator do? What could the technology coordinator do? What are some things you can do so that you're ready? When you get questions, how can you test the system? How do you know how much time it will take? How do you do the scheduling? We came up with an example schedule at a charter school and one LEA gave us their schedule of how they tested the students, how they were able to fit it in the same test window that they had before. They rotated labs, they set up mobile labs, they did what they had to do to make it work. So we tried to come up with some good examples. We also, on the resources page, have a comparability report. It compares our test scores on the online test versus the paper pencil. There's no statistic statistically significant difference in scores. So students, you know, most of the people's test scores are going down. We don't want to do that. Well, not necessarily true that they do. For most people, they improve or stay about the same, or is the general um, fluctuation just between students from year to year. So there's not a huge impact on performance, whether it's on paper or it's online. And then we also have test specifications for the new tests that are coming out in the next year, the new generation of assessments, what's going to be included, where does that draw from the new set of standards, and then just the general information on the system itself and how to access different things and for the different content areas. So all of that is available on the website for different resources and great places that you can connect your districts and schools to whenever they have questions. That's kind of high level for assessments. Great. Three, three great overviews by, by four panelists, and uh, they did a great job staying within their allotted time, which gives us about a half hour for questions. I'm sure there's lots of things you folks want to know more about. Yes? I have a question on this timeline for the assessments that you were talking about. So a current ninth grader who's tested this year in English one, and then a lot of them algebra one next year is going to be retested in English two, and then the following year could potentially be tested as a 11th grader in English and math again. It could be your skip in there somewhere, but um, yes, I think is the right answer. <laughs> I so would which of those tests would come out for that kid? For, say that kid was proficient in the English and the math, and mm -hmm. is on his merry way this year, and as an 11th grader, for whatever reason, <coughs> wasn't. Um, well, each of the tests is testing something a little bit different, so I'm not sure what the, the, the evaluation analysis side of that would be. That's a, I would have to go back so to the like test team and ask them what the difference would be from that part analysis assessment. I mean, you're expecting that we'd be evaluating a school's performance right. on one same group of kids only. Yeah, it would be different. It would be different. 
It's, it's sort of like when you change the text when you change the standards, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, but if you change the years, you get the same kids repeatedly. Yeah, it's still so yeah, there's definitely something to work out there. Good, good question. Other questions? It's got to be more questions about all this stuff. Uh, what ILPs are you expecting to put out? We actually, uh, yeah, we're uh, currently wrapping up, so I'll, I'll, I'll miss some of them, but. But so on the business platform side, there's this iSeries uh, uh, RFP that has been on the street, not wrapped up yet. That's these AS 400s that where districts run their business applications on it. Uh, so that that's one. So we're uh, the next uh, closest is the interactive uh, or the identity management system, which is this ID uh, thing. It's about four or five weeks from RFP, uh, and, uh, and then the learning object repository is probably six weeks from going out for RFP, although we're attempting, we're hoping that it uh, can be an extension of an existing contract with the community colleges. Aquila is the contractor for that currently. Uh, and we have uh, a data analysis uh, package that we're uh, putting out for bid that will be what we call AMTR 3.0, sort of a whole new generation of data collection and analysis that will be you know, interactively available from uh, uh, from the OE perspective, from any user perspective. Uh, we uh, we are uh, couples are broken into pieces. Uh, we have, we're uh, doing bids on uh, sort of a standardized, we'll call it email approach, uh, and, uh, and, and we're currently reviewing uh, uh, vendors uh, to sort of get a better idea. It's like this process, this public process of RFPs is you, you can talk to vendors until the day you go out with an RFP and then you can't talk to them anymore. Uh, and so we try to talk as long as we can before before we go out, uh, but uh, sometimes you have to fight our way through all the vendors gathered in our lobby. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah you, you think of it. There's a a lot of money uh, in race to the top uh, in technology related uh, programs. We're talking about 120 million dollars, uh, which really, really should give us uh, uh, a leg up. But that's sort of a half a dozen of those, of those ten. We'll be more information on those as we go through. Let me ask a related question about the, the IAS, because I've been involved in some of the earlier discussions, and we chatted a little bit during the break, but it might help people to know. As um, you said, as it began with really a focus on diagnostic assessment, it, it grew bigger and bigger, and now I understand it's been a long process to do the RFP and get it out, and it'll be a long process to do it. Um, does that mean that it's going to be like years before we have it, or was it likely to be built with pieces so that folks will have some diagnostic assessment or some resources soon and others will be added? Does it become all one big thing, or can it be cut up into pieces? So the vision is that we can, we'll deploy the pilot in pieces as they are available, but by the end of the grant period, there will be one unified system to everybody. Um, more specifically, we, don't, we a lot of it's going to have to be conversations with the vendors as they provide the bid responses since we go through the evaluation pieces, and then working with that vendor on the strategy so they can put out there. Some vendors may be more able to take a product that they have, kind of parse it up into individual pieces that are deployed or independently, but they still communicate with one another. Buzz up may have much more monolithic approaches and say we kind of have to just do this all at the same time at the end. Um, so a lot of it, we're, we're going to try and have as much of it as available to the field as possible when it's ready to be used. Um, and hopefully not release too much of the buggy products that we then have to spend a long time working out the kinks before actually using it. The other flip side of that is we're talking about the product, but what about the content that goes in there? 
Um, so that is also an ongoing process as we look to see what the product will look like depending upon the vendor or vendor selected. We're already in the process of identifying resources. Think about Learn and See and everything they have. Uh, think about the districts you work with. Many of them have already come up with all kinds of wonderful resources that if we can scale that up for the state level usage and sharing of all of those resources. So um, districts have come forth um, using their race to the top funds. We would like to focus on this piece of the content. So these kinds of conversations are already occurring so that as we have the product, we will also have the content to back so, so we have this state level LOR, and then you were talking about an LMS. Would that be at the district level, and they make their choice on what platform they want to go on? Or? Actually, it would be a default LMS, uh, and so the requirements of the uh, LOR and other resources, uh, including IIS, would be that it could interface with, there would be standard interfaces with an LMS system. Uh, many LEAs have an LMS, so they don't want to fail on the one they have. Many don't. Uh, and so it would be an, L, an, an, an individual choice. Uh, people like TOPS and people like NCBPS will drive the early decisions there because they have the largest requirements now for an LMS to distribute throughout the state. Uh, but the answer is it would be an LEA choice. Do, do folks need some translations of all these acronyms going there? <laughs> uh, everybody, the LMS is a learning management system, things like Blackboard and Moodle are the most popular ones. LOR is a learning objects repository, it's basically a library of, of lessons and modules and pieces that it's using. LEA, I think you all know. <laughs> the LMS and the LOR are NCBPS. NCBPS is a virtual public school. So I, I think that's one, of the, one of the things we should agree to as we work across the different groups is to try not to talk only in acronyms. Sometimes it's so easy. Isn't it? I, I know, but then I look so around. Sometimes we don't know what they stand for. Does everybody know? <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. No, we, we all fall into it. <laughs> it really happens to most, but like we'll be a DPI if, if there's a, a really a determination of having broad engagement and interaction on these projects, and you'll have around this room, you'll have both basically instructionally focused uh, uh, roles and then technically focused roles, and I see there are very few tweeners, <laughs> and so they talk their jargon and they talk their jargon. And we all look around waiting for someone to interpret it for us. Well, well the problem is just like you have the same acronym for two totally different things. <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I won't even tell you about the friend of mine who is at MIT and an expert in AI, <laughs> which means artificial intelligence when you're at who was traveling cross country and got engaged in a conversation with somebody else who was an expert in the AI, but in that world it meant artificial insemination. <laughs> 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 Thank you for everything. <laughs> so, uh, that's what I think of what these acronyms are. I had one or two more things, but other, I saw you had, did you have a question? Well, I was just thinking as we're developing the cloud, right now when I walk into a school building, I walk in with an iPad, a smartphone, and a computer, and I take up three IP addresses. If I get there early enough, I can grab those addresses. But as the day goes on, if one drops off, I can't get it back again. So as we develop it, are we, are we going to encourage student usage of these kinds of devices, or are we still going to be pretty much locked down where it's just school equipment this year? say that, that uh, the only economic solution to ubiquitous devices is to bring your own device. Uh, and well, they to have, have a multitude of devices. It's the only feasible approach. Uh, and, uh, and the services that provide, you know, the sort of the, the links and the, the, the security and the protection, those are all known technologies that can be provided as a service to the schools. We're actually in the process of rolling that out at MCMC right now. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's pennies on the dollar compared to what LEAs are today spending for their own web security 
uh, and uh, so you know, that's that is that is the only realistic path. Uh, as Kayla knows, we're we're actually going to be in a meeting next week to begin talking about uh, devices because it's an unsolved uh, uh, issue uh, in the state. So we talk about a lot of things that, need, that weren't going to be possible, but not if you don't have a glass in front of every stakeholder. Uh, and so I mean, there are unanswered questions, and so we're building on the foundation. And, and some build on each other, uh, but that's sort of, I mean, it's, it's a <coughs> major state issue. It, to, and that, that's really a, a national issue. We're working with COSIN, the Consortium of School Networking, and stuff like that. There's another acronym for everybody. You may know that? BY, well, COSIN is Consortium of School Networking, but BYOD? Bring your own device. Bring your own device. That's a, another one that you'll be. I thought that would bring your own drinks. So not only do they call it BYOT, but they call it BYOT. My question was about sustainability for the districts and cost and what happens next after the cloud is here and we're moving through this process five, seven, ten years down the road. What do they do? Major, major issue. Part of the part of the delay in in rate to the top programs being uh, rolled out is this uh, total cost of operation and the sustainability question. You don't know what IIS is going to cost until you bid it, uh, and particularly IIS because it's so new. Uh, but even on some of the more like like identity management, you know, no one has identity management system that serves a statewide uh, use like what we're planning, uh, and so so that's part of part of the equation is to try to get a good understanding of what things are likely to cost, and and then be able to sort of work on a sustainability model. That includes being able to determine how the LEAs today are spending their money, what it is these multitude of programs are going to provide that might replace those where there would be cost savings, or where you're going to provide services that the LEA was going to have to do anyway. Uh, so like some may not be provision for online testing, but they're going to be doing online testing. So it's a cost that they that they have to be looking at. Uh, and at the same time, DPI needs to be sort of reviewing and is its total cost structure and the kind of services that it delivers because the total package is sort of that sustainability model. And as Glenn already said, I mean, he's doing great work trying to help uh, inform the legislature where there are needs uh, that, that fully need to be addressed. So it's a, it's, it's a tremendously complex issue uh, compounded by the current economic conditions in LAAs. Uh, and uh, I had a couple of superintendents last week ask me, so if you roll out this program and it looks like it's going to be expensive and we can't figure out how to pay for it, what will we do? Well, I guess we don't do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. Is, is there any more to add on the IIS side about this? Or? Yep. From, we're facing a lot of the same kinds of issues that the cloud services will face. Um, right now, the only anticipated mandated use for the instructional improvement system will be for the statewide summers. Um, everything else, uh, right now, we're envisioning is a la carte. And we're going to continue to get feedback from the field about how that works. A lot of those conversations will also have to be done with the vendor who provide, vendor or vendors who provide the solution um, based upon what kind of pricing structure we can work out with them. And we are at, just like without anticipating there will be some cost savings as well for if a district is currently subscribing to a benchmarking system that they want to drop that and pick up the one from the IAS. Or if they currently have a subscription to a resource provider like um, Discovery Education or something like that. There may be cost savings in us having a statewide license for the resources that the district can then tap into rather than doing 
115 plus cards of school individual subscriptions or something. Some cost savings there that a portion of them can be redirected into using the system by pieces. But finding out the, the cost model is going to be a conversation with the vendor um, and uh, with the political environment in general. And that's, that's going to be one of my biggest jobs going forward, particularly as the IS, because I work with um, Philip Price is the guy, to try and imagine what the cost sharing model is going to look like in the way that it's sustainable. If I can add a couple of things on this, those that involved in this, when we did the race to the top proposal on this issue about how the program falling off the cliff at the end. And of course, if you're not willing to go to the edge of the cliff, you can't write and do one of these proposals because you can't look five, six, seven years ahead and guarantee things, uh, particularly with the, the economic times and changes. And look, you know, you're looking past the current legislators and past the current government. Um, so we try to do two things. One is um, basically build good things like these folks we talked about. Get them out there. Make sure we have our serious evaluation of them so we can document use and value. And then use that to go back. And some of this will require continued state funding um, and will require convincing legislators that this is worth funding. So I think that's an important thing for you folks to think in mind. This doesn't happen magically. It happens if all the local legislators here, you know, this is really important. And it's saving us money here, but it's costing us money here. But we need the state support to keep this going, and it is valuable for our teachers and kids. So, you know, that was the sort of approach that we could take there. Um, you know, a couple of other pieces. One is I'm convinced there are significant savings, probably because we used to have a room upstairs until a month or two ago filled with servers and with this big air conditioner. And if the air conditioner went off, a magical thing happened, and our tech guy was called day or night, he came running in to shut the servers down. And um, it cost us a lot to replace these servers, to maintain them. And we've moved all that out to the cloud. I don't know where it is. It's out in Amazon somewhere. It might be in North Carolina. It might be in Australia. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I was amazed at how little it costs to buy space out in the cloud. And you have things running in these giant places where they have genuine 24-7 support and backup power systems and all the things we would never have. So it's costing us less. It's much easier on our tech folks. And we gained an office space back because we have a room that used to have these servers. So I think people will find savings. Um, but it's not going to be a straight deduction. I've also worked on plans for moving to digital resources. So kids can get things online and have the kinds of advantages um, Kayla talked about for technology. But it's not just that you take the price of well, you, you won't buy textbooks, but you'll be buying devices, you'll be buying licenses that rather than a once every five years purchase, probably an annual license, but then you might save money around adaptations for special needs kids, because those are, so it's not a simple, you know, you take this out, you add this in, it really is changing um, the way some of this looks. So I think there's going to be a lot, you know, for folks to work through um, to do this, but uh, I think, you know, we've seen here, I think, amazing progress in moving in these directions, but it's not easy, and there's going to be a lot of times that involve us, especially you folks and the folks you're working with in the LEA is going to really want more specific detailed information before it can be made available for the folks here. And that's just, I think mean, you're going to have to accept that and work through it um, as this process goes on. So, you know that. Yes. We do work with the LEAs. There's a lot yes. of hand wringing and angst and Absolutely. fear and anger out there right now. Yep. And I think it's predicated, honestly, on the fact that they think we're going to fuck this all up. Can you give us the help to let, you know, calm some of that down? We, we talked in the prior session about the, the current focus on communication and some things that go on. Folks want to go through some of that? Would be helpful. Um, I work also with uh, one of the communication teams and the department working with Brisbane Top Efforts. And we have kind of coming up a series of meetings in each region. There'll be two meetings in each region. There's only one in Region 1, but two meetings everywhere. And it, they're the ready meetings, if you've heard them phrased that way. Um, that, those meetings are specifically targeted to the audience of every single principal in the state has been invited and they are to bring one teacher with them. We've also invited every superintendent to attend in their um, region and then the public information officers or the communication directors have been invited for each district. So that's
that, that's our target audience for the initial set of messages. And the idea was that we could have a large group, it'll be about 6,000 people over the course of the next month, really, that we will reach with the, the same message, pretty much telling them some of the same things. And one of the things that we want to do is to be an inspiring message, but a calming message at the same time, to let them know that all this stuff is new and it's coming, it seems like it's coming really fast, but it's for a good purpose and that it's not just to check off the box and make sure we did something, that it's to make things better, it's for improvements, to make life easier for teachers, life easier for students, life easier for principals. It's, it just takes time to get there. And so, kind of the big topic areas that we'll cover at these meetings, one is around the support for learning and that will be um, new assessments, new standards, and the new accountability model. That'll be kind of packaged together. Maria Petrie Martin and Angel Quick are the primary presenters on those topics. So they'll cover um, just high level what's going on with new assessments, new standards, and the new accountability model. The next piece there is then our support for teachers, teaching and um, the teacher evaluation. This looks at the teacher effectiveness work, the NC Teacher Corps, the professional development that's going on, the new standards that have been added to the teacher evaluation system, the standard um, for student growth, the measure for student growth that's been added, so it'll focus on that and how, how, how all of that works together, and how that connects back to new standards, new assessments, new accountability, kind of piecing things together. From there, so we've got the student learning part, we've got the teacher part, the next piece is the technology support that we'll go into some of the topics around IIS. We'll touch on the idea of bring your own technology, your own device, where we're going with that, the cloud, kind of how there'll be technology supports in place to deliver a lot of this stuff and how that will work. And then kind of ending with um, the last topic area is the district and school transformation and the services and the things that they're doing out in the field and what they're doing with schools now and just touching on that. We'll also um, hear from uh, principal of the year and teacher of the year at some of those that so we'll have someone there that can talk to their experience as a classroom person, as a principal, as an administrator at school, what they see happen and what they're excited about looking forward. So there's a couple of things going on at those meetings. The final thing that they'll have to take away from the meeting is in each of these topic areas we put together a series of documents, kind of one page handouts that they can take back, you can share them with all the teachers in the school, they can even go home to parents. So they, we try to make them quick, easy, quick reference documents almost. Some of them are kind of FAQ, some of them are like a top 10 things you need to know. Um, there's a glossary with all the acronyms to spell out things so that people understand what we're talking about. We try to make it you know, friendly to, to go to multiple audiences. It also will help the communication directors to go back. Now they have something to share with the news. They have something to share when they're trying to communicate out about new stuff, something new to put on their website, some way to connect that. We will also launch, at the same time this is going on, the Ready website through the DPI website. All of these resources that I've just mentioned will be posted there, available to all uh, DPI staff, public, everybody, <laughs> once they're out there. So you can use those when you get questions. It's a quick reference that you could go back and say, oh, I read that somewhere, you know, I have a guide I can check back to, or you can direct them right there to one set of resources covers all of this. So that's kind of a big wave of communication where we're hoping to address the high level. These are big topics, big initiatives. This is the work going on in education right now and here's how it kind of connects and to, to get that conversation started, to get people to know where we are at the park with planning and structure and where we're going, but then to give them a chance to offer some feedback on their concerns and their fears going forward. We'll follow up from the meetings with some webinars and some different meetings over the next few months. There may be something that comes up at summer institutes where you can get some additional feedback there. We'll have webinars in April that we already have scheduled that we know are going to happen and then we, we hope to schedule some more maybe in the fall to say, okay, now we gave you all that information. You had a chance to think about it. What questions do you have? What else do you think you need? What more, what more can we provide to answer questions that you're getting from concerned parents and concerned teachers or what have you seen from students that you think we should, we should try to address at this level? So that's kind of a big push right now that will reach a, a pretty large audience and we're hoping that that's a very effective way to, to really get things moving forward and getting started that those principals and teachers go back to their school and they serve as leaders to share this information to, to help deliver that same message to those that are not able to attend the meeting. Are you a regional meeting? Mm -hmm. So you're meeting with us tomorrow yeah. uh, and this is dead on the issue of tomorrow's meeting so for others so the regional leads and the instructional technology consultants are regionally based and assigned, and, uh, and, and it appears obvious that we need to bridge this huge communication gap. So as hard as we try, IIS has 100 LEA people participating in an advisory role. We also have 100 
regionally uh, assigned to that. And, and if there's not a day goes by that, that someone says to me, my superintendent doesn't have the slightest idea what you're talking about. Uh, and so, so we're so you know culturally we're dealing with individual fiefdoms, silos within the LAAs, tech directors who don't have an opportunity to communicate to the CFO. And, I mean, so all of those issues occur, and there is a lot of stuff going on, important stuff that's very uh, large uh, financially as well as what might be required. So tomorrow, we're hoping to sort of think through a little bit about how we can do this better. And this isn't a discussion just for cloud. It's, you know, so like IIS and we work closest together because our programs, they're a little hard to even separate at times. Uh, and so that's another, a, another approach. You know, today, you know, Phil's in the Northeast at the at the recent meeting. So we, when we go to all these meetings where we have selective discussions, uh, and all of that is on top of the fact that we're not quite ready to talk about what it is that a superintendent really wants. What is it that you're offering? When is it going to be available? And how much is it going to be cost? So that I can decide when I plan my budget what I need to buy myself versus what I'm going to be able to get from others. I mean, that... When you said last year, you said there's superintendent meetings that they're going to go to March. Yeah, we have uh, the, the, the court and superintendent meeting, uh, the uh, administrative uh, meeting at uh, the end of the uh, end of March, where we'll have a lot more input. But you know, folks, it's the topic. Folks asked in the earlier session, what's your idea? Cloud team and your owners could just put out sort of a schedule of these things. Yes, we we know you need to know this. And we plan. We expect you to answer these questions you know, in March or May or whatever it is. I think it could be very helpful. People are asking for that. Did you have some other pieces to add? So I think what you're hearing, um, at least what I'm hearing, um, is that these folks and their teams are working incredibly hard on important work. Uh, we all have sort of taken the plunge here into the unknown, but we know things have to change, technology has to be better employed. Um, and that while there's lots of efforts at communication, if there's never enough, there will be more. And there's also efforts at coordination going on across these groups that I think are increasing. So, I mean, to me, and I, I've been around this education technology stuff for a long time, these are amazing things that are being built. And there'll be some glitches. It won't all be perfect the day it rolls out. But these really are the tremendous steps forward in bringing education into the, the information communication age. So um, we're about out of time. I think perhaps we should take a moment and, and thank our panelists who did their job. We know who they are. If there are questions you didn't get to ask, I think you can sure you can grab these folks in a few minutes during the, uh, the changeover break. Thank you all. Very good. Yeah. Yeah.